session to preside it with my friend, uh, Professor Jean-Jacques Legrand, who is a faithful and a pillar, a pillar of discipline because uh, uh, the meet meetings are, uh, with Albatross and ATHS are uh, every year or every two years. Uh, I, w I, I will be very happy if I'm as good as you when I'm your age. Uh, and we brought forward this session uh, because, uh, well, this is, is a very uh, uh, a subject that, and our friends in Spain know this subject of attention deficit and hyperactivity. And you won't be surprised to have a, a renowned researcher who's Spanish in the panel, so I'll give the floor to our kites who will be presenting Savio. Uh, and uh, and then Mr. Uh, Francis Levin will, uh, Ms. Francis Levin, thank you very much. Well, we have changed the order of the program. It was uh, Pepe Martinez Raga will begin, then France, Francis uh, Levin. So he's the head of psychiatry at the hospital in Valencia. He's also associated professor at the University of Valencia. And he's the vice president of the Spanish Society of, of Dual Pathologies, a Spanish society that has been for many years the society that has uh, um, disseminated uh, the, the subject around the world and with uh, the with, uh, uh, World Association of uh, uh, Dual Disorders. He's also a member. I'll give the um, that there's been a TADA uh, con European consensus, which has been written up in 2018, which has been translated into French by our colleague Hervé Cassig, and it's a very fascinating document, 20 odd pages, and which is uh, supported by 350 studies. If you have any doubts about the real existence um, of this illness, you can look it up in that document. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Arkaitz. You're very kind. And that's about my, uh, it for my French. <laughs> um, so I'm really sorry not, not to be able to speak in French. Um, as I said, um, thank you very much, Arkaitz. Uh, thank you, Jean-Pierre. Thank you, Amin. Thank you, Professor de Glon. Um, it's really a pleasure to be, to be here, to be once again in, in Biarritz in this fantastic meeting. And thank you for your attendance. Um, as I said, for, for me, it's, it's, really, it's, it's really a joy to talk about ADHD. Um, and uh, we decided to switch turns because I'll, I'll be talking more about general aspects uh, to end up uh, discussing some of the issues about the dual disorders. And Professor Levin will be talking about treatment, so that's why we decided to, to focus. So, um, as I said, ADHD is, is one of my area of interest, and um, I, I, I tend to say that I, I like lost, lost causes, uh, like addictions, and uh, among psychiatry, this is always a lost cause, and in ADHD is even more so. So, putting them both together becomes a real uh, Don Quixote issue, more than anything. Um, it's often said that ADHD is an, it's more than invention, and that, uh, or the industry, or whatever. Um, even that DSM-3 is who actually put DSM, um, ADHD into the picture. But that's absolutely false. I mean, this history of ADHD goes back at least to the, 18th cent uh, to the 17th century, when the two major psychiatric books, uh, equivalent to the ca today's Kaplan, um, actually included a full chapter on ADHD, uh, not solely in children, but also in adults, and uh, actually put ADHD in the picture, and actually were very influential throughout the, the 18th century, um, when all the French, German, and English psychiatrists developed what uh, we actually know of our current psychopathology, and actually part of it was, was ADHD. In any case, ADHD is common, it's a complex and it's a multifactorial neurodevelopmental disorder which is characterized, and that's part of the problems we'll discuss a bit later, uh, of a pattern of inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. This heterogeneity 
actually makes it. And uh, I was helping my 15-year-old my uh, with his homework and uh, was doing this um, ma math task about um, connecting how many combinations. And actually, there are 187 possible combinations of ADHD symptoms. Um, therefore, the phenotypes are very variable, very diverse, and uh, makes part of this heterogeneity. And part of it also is a consequence of the high com comorbidity rates. And among them, substance use disorders, as we are discussing today, is particularly common. Um, the, the theology is actually crucial to understand why uh, ADHD needs to be uh, one of the <coughs> forefront disorders in our common practice, because it's one of the psychiatric disorders with more research on its etiological basis. Uh, we know that the genetic um, influence is huge, but also we have a lot of data on all the neuroanatomical and neurochemical and neurobiological basis, even more so than schizophrenia, bipolar disorders, or other disorders, and even so, uh, there is continuous discussion and, and doubts about its existence, which um, is absolutely outrageous at, uh, at the end of the day. The genetic influence of uh, ADHD uh, is about 70 to 80 percent. Um, and that comes into a, actually a curious phenomenon, which, which is that often Nowadays, that there is more sensitivity about children, and there are, um, the number of children identified, diagnosed, and treated for ADHD has increased. A lot of parents come into practice saying, look, I had the same problems, I have the same problems, I am the same. So would you, would I, could I have an assessment and, and see whether I have ADHD? Um, I tend to call this the uh, inverse genetic phenomenon. <laughs> um, but. Um, as I said, the influence is extremely high, I'm, I'm even higher than schizophrenia, and uh, to the same level as the height or the eye color. But also the neurobiological basis. We know that ADHD is a disorder of executive functions. So beyond inattention, beyond hyperactivity, beyond impulsivity, it involves what we are as human beings, which is the executive functions. And the executive functions are regulated um, mostly through the prefrontal cortex. But as most parts of our brain, they are all linked together with different other areas involving the emotional control, the amygdala, uh, the vessel ganglia, the hypothalamus. But the cerebellum is crucial, again, to understand the, the arousal, the dual disorders connectivity, and, and many of the executive functions. Um, and that's where some of the, the targets for the treatment lays, and also where the, the links with, with substance use disorder is into place. Um, as you can see, I mean, the link is very crucial. It's very complex, but uh, reward is one of the key aspects that is um, impaired in individuals with ADHD. And therefore, the connection with the reward circuit, the reinforcement circuit, is, is crucial to understand why the, the comorbidity is so huge, so high in individuals with ADHD, as we will we'll be discussing. And actually, as I said, um, um, many of the reactions, many of the behaviors, many of the symptoms that we can elicit in individuals with ADHD are very much related with what has been actually uh, um, clearly shown in neuroimaging studies, and where it's shown that there is a um, impairment in the brain activation of the reward system. Uh, ADHD individuals uh, all, um, tend to seek short-term rewards. They cannot wait. They cannot expect something at the end of the academic year. Um, so training psychologically, training medically, training with psychoeducation is crucial as part of the long-term treatment of ADHD. To, and, but understanding there is a neurobiological basis to it. And as I said, ADHD is a very common disorder. I mean, it's often um, all over in the press. Uh, everyone knows about everything. Everyone comments about everything, but very few people actually, uh, journalists, even clinicians, actually tend to or have put the effort to, to look into the data. And we need to look into the data. The actual prevalence of ADHD in childhood is between 3.4 and 7.2. Um, in, in the States, um, the proportion of individuals that are treated 
um, is fairly high. But in Europe, it's not. In, in, in the best case scenario of some of the northern European countries, it goes to 1 to 2% one to of diagnosed children. In Spain, it goes beyond 1%. Uh, in France, it's even lower. So identification is crucial because as we will be discussing, I mean, the long-term consequences are huge. But uh, the, uh, let's not forget that it, ADHD is not a childhood disorder. It goes far beyond that. And about two-thirds of, of children and adolescents of ADHD continue with symptomatology, continue with a full disorder when they become adults. So that the prevalence in adult population is between three to five percent. So, and this is a very, very nice review that they actually put the different um, trajectories. And while there is a proportion that uh, with a remission as uh, brain maturation comes into place and the dopamine and neuro neuroadrenaline systems actually um, get more balanced, um, there are also a proportion of, of children, adolescents who have been subthreshold. And when they become um, up adolescents, they become adults, actually the symptoms become more prominent, partly because their functional uh, demands are much higher, partly because uh, um, high IQ um, counterparts with some of the demands um, go into secondary school, partly because the parents work as their executive function, as their prefrontal cortex. And when a child gets 16, he doesn't want to hear about mother or father telling them how to do the homework or, or how to prepare their exam. So that's often also um, uh, key to, to bear in mind that although symptoms have to be present before the age of 12, the full disorder doesn't have to be manifest um, at, at an early age. Um, so why do we say that it's underdiagnosed? Well, as I said, I mean, only a small proportion of children, even smaller, proportion of adults, less than 0.2% uh, of the adult population has a diagnosis of ADHD, while the real, in Europe at least, uh, while the prevalence is 2.5. And this is a good example why uh, that, that shows what I'm trying to say. Uh, this is a study conducted throughout Europe with uh, over 2,000 um, individuals who were attending uh, psychiatric outpatient treatment. They were coming because they were depressed, they were anxious, they had a manic episode, they had a substance use disorder. Um, none of them had been diagnosed of ADHD, none of them knew about ADHD, and they conducted this study with the DIVA, which is a, a structured interview, um, which can be downloaded from the internet. Uh, it's very helpful in, in clinical practice. In any case, none of them had the diagnosis, and as you can see, uh, those individuals who were coming for other disorders and probably would have ended up getting an SSRI or a mood stabilizer or an antipsychotic and no mention about ADHD medication uh, in between 9 and 30 uh, odd percent of them were actually individuals with ADHD. What's the problem? The huge comorbidity. Uh, finding an individual with solely ADHD is almost like finding a, an addict, uh, addicted individual without any other comorbid disorder. Uh, over 80% of patients with ADHD have another psychiatric disorder, and often in adults, what we actually diagnose is the psychiatric disorder and forget about ADHD uh, for many different reasons. But as this uh, very recent study actually highlights uh, in young, young adults, um, these were individuals who um, had um, symptoms of ADHD who had, um, um, no, had, hadn't been diagnosed and treated as a child, but uh, where um, the severity of ADHD was hugely, was highly, significantly associated with a higher concurrence of substance use disorder, personality disorders, in, as well as more psychosocial env and environmental problems. So if we don't become aware, if we don't diagnose, th that individual is gonna be doing poorly along the lifespan. Um, and poorly could, would, could mean doing it at 40% of their potential, or 20%, maybe 60%, but I mean, when, when someone has the capacity to, to have something that holds them and not being able to, to embassy it, diagnose and treat it, I mean, it's really, it's really sad. So part of the problem, as I said, is that we often think about ADHD as impulsivity, hyperactivity, inattention, um, 
with our residents, for instance, in, the, in their first clinics, they say, well, these uh, individuals that come from transitional, from childhood, and they had been diagnosed, they had, had very thorough assessments throughout their childhood, had been treated, and they come because they, they have grown older, uh, they are 16, 18, and, and come to our clinic. They say, oh, the, the child doesn't move. Um, I don't understand why he has ADHD, and uh, well, let, let's look carefully. I mean, let's do a full assessment and see what actually um, the difficulties in executive functions, what are present, and uh, if uh, we, we say in Spanish, there is no, no one, there is no one blinder than the one who doesn't want to see, and that's often what happens in clinical practice. That often we mislook or don't look into what we have in on the other side of the table. And uh, the real issue about ADHD is the, all the consequences, the schools, employment, the, the high comorbidity with anxiety symptoms, with mood disorders, with sleep disorders, uh, with low self-esteem, which accompanies the, the individual throughout their lifespan, and the concurrent dual disorders. Um, so what, what is actually the impact? Well, um, it's, it's part of the issue of being a developmental disorder is that throughout their lifespan, the impact varies uh, um, as their demands, as their needs of an individual um, varies. I mean, a child just do, does two things. I mean, either goes to school and, or plays, um, but an adult has many different fronts open, and they have to face all those different fronts, and that where uh, issues like motor accidents, where parenting problems, where divorce, where employment issues, uh, and as well as mood instability and substance use disorders come into place. Um, and that's often why individuals come into practice uh, looking for an assessment when they're in their 40s, in their 50s, or in their 60s even. So putting into numbers, uh, having ADHD actually increased by 50% uh, having a bike accident at times when the doctor recommend, recommended the patient to stop during holidays, uh, the bike accidents increased hugely. Um, the uh, academic failure, um, the problems with divorce, with separation, with sibling fights, uh, with poor parenting, with absenteeism at the, at the work uh, front, and the huge rate of disorders, twice to three times higher risk of having a substance use disorder than with individuals without ADHD. But not only that, uh, the economic impact is also extremely important. Um, this is a, a, a rather pivotal study because, I mean, uh, although it's already six years old, I mean, it has data that actually puts very much into frame the costs of having ADHD and not treating, but also the impact at different levels. Um, and as you can see in, 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 figure, in, in your right figure, um, with children, I mean, most of the costs, costs are involved in health, healthcare, but in adults, it's productivity loss, it's in, loss of income, is the impact at the functional level. That's why it's called a disorder and not a disease, because the impact, the functionality is very much affected. Um, but looking into cl looking at it closer, this is a very recent study published by the Danish, um, which have published a series of studies of, um, from based on their epidemiological records. And actually, what th 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 it's a very clever study because what they did actually is they had a final cohort of um, uh, of oh, sorry, what's happened? Oh, okay, well, of 460 individuals with ADHD and their siblings. Okay, so similar environmental, similar um, uh, familiar parenting styles and, and similar issues. So, and they looked into actually what happened in terms of the economic impact. And uh, what they actually found is, 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 is highlighted there is that the uh, individuals with ADHD had consider considerably lower disposable income, they paid less taxes, um, but also because of less poor work, poor academic records, uh, and, but also had higher costs at, at different levels, we'll see in a second, actually. Um, so as you, you see the numbers here, I mean, the income difference is, is, is huge. I mean, it's 12,000 euros. Um, and so it's a drop in their, in their social class, in a sense. Um, but also the impact in terms of um, um, the, the income tax, the crime, 
traffic problems, uh, um, stays in foster care, but, and also the medical expenses. So that the co total cost differences, having ADHD involves 20,000 euros. And often we discuss about 100 euros of uh, medication or treatment. I mean, it's so important to diagnose, but also to, to treat a disorder with a huge response to medication or, and to treatment in general. Um, not only that, actually, we can see it is graphically the, the impact at different levels. Um, uh, the primary care, uh, prescribed medication, secondary health care. Uh, so the overall uh, cost difference is 20,000 euros, um, which involves all the private or individual costs and all the public or social costs that uh, differ between the, the individual with ADHD and their sibling. What actually they also did in this study is to try to make a gross comparison between different countries. And, and it's good because they actually included France as well. Um, and uh, they, they did, the, the, well, they, 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 this were 2010 data um, with a population of 40,000 million French. Uh, two prevalence estimates, the, the classic um, meta-analysis, which actually with the 2.5 uh, prevalence in, in adults, which is what actually is included in DSM-5. Uh, the cost of having ADHD is around 20,000 euros in, in France. Uh, the other study is uh, using ICD-10 and uh, uh, so a very conservative approach, but even with very low uh, prevalence. I mean, the difference is 4,000 euros a year. Um, and um, the, the difference between the different countries involves different aspects. I mean, the, 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 these are general costs, gross costs, uh, compared to the specific costs that uh, were in the primary analysis that I just presented of the study. But, I mean, this is a lot of money. Uh, if we just, uh, as often managers tell us about how expensive our treatments are or how expensive we are, um, and how little, how, how little salary we deserve. So, um, uh, data, data. The impact goes beyond that. And for instance, uh, if we go into the criminal consequences, as, as the economic stu uh, study um, highlighted, we can, this is a, a fantastic meta-analysis published last year. 102 studies, 70,000 individuals, the prevalence of ADHD in jail is 26%. There are studies not solely in the States, but across the world, across different European countries um, and uh, other parts, as I said, of Asia and South America. Um, not only that, but I mean, um, there are studies showing that treatment actually decreases uh, relapse into criminal activities and facilitates rehabilitation. Um, so again, diagnosis and treatment is, is hugely important. Now, to put it even more complex, I mean, the risk of having a substance use disorder in if you have ADHD and are in prison increases by, by 2.4% uh, compared to not having ADHD um, in prison. Um, so again, I mean, um, which is, um, in a sense, a parallel to what's happening in general population. And more so, I mean, why, why are we saying that it's so relevant to, to talk about ADHD? Well, it goes beyond uh, the, the common consequences. And again, the Danish study, which included 60% the, the, um, of the Danish population, so almost 2 million, and included almost uh, 32,000 individuals with ADHD. What they actually found is that the mortality rate for any cause was almost six points uh, for every 10,000 for individuals with ADHD compared to only 2.2 with for individuals without ADHD. So three times higher uh, having ADHD and having a premature death. Um, more so, the later the diagnosis, the higher the mortality rate. So if you were diagnosed in childhood and were treated in childhood, the mortality rate is even lower than in general population. So at the same levels as general population. So um, a delayed diagnosis or non-diagnosis actually um, increases mortality rate. Well, we can see this here graphically, which even is often more visual. Um, but uh, beyond that, actually, um, the factors that were associated with, with higher mortality rate were not congenital problems, heart failure, or brain problems. The, Okay, oof, male. 
I was too slow. Okay. Um, so it was actually the combination with substance use. Uh, it was substance use, it was conduct disorders, it was impulsivity. So actually consequences of ADHD were actually the issues related to a uh, huge mortality, uh, higher mortality rate. And suicide is also higher among individuals with ADHD. This is a very recent meta-analysis by Samuel Cortez and his team. And they showed that suicidal attempts, suicidal ideation, suicidal plans, and completed suicides are higher among individuals with ADHD. So um, this is a suicide attempts. The odds ratio was 2.4 uh, of all the different studies. The odds ratio for suicidal ideation was 3.5. The odds ratio for uh, suicidal plans 4.4, 4.5, and the odds ratio for completed suicide is 6.7. Uh, so that's huge and, and makes us aware of the importance of diagnosing. Beyond that, and putting into the, into the, in the big picture, we know schizophrenia and depression are the two psychiatric disorders mostly associated with, with suicide. But uh, underneath that, uh, depressive uh, anxiety disorders um, and then ADHD with a, with a 2.4 odds ratio uh, in this compar comparison, uh, also published very recently. And um, so, and again, um, in, in this study, again, from the Danish group, what they actually found is the incident suicidal behavior was 4.7 for individuals with ADHD without, compared to those without ADHD. And the importance about the study is, as we heard earlier by Royal Ways, by Ikram Aramani, and by Jifra Kamina, uh, is, is that having other comorbid disorders actually even makes the odds ratio higher. So the incidence rates goes up to 10.4. 10 10 um, so diagnosing ADHD and diagnosing the comorbid disorders is hugely important. ADHD is associated with any disorders. Uh, the, the increased likelihood of having another disorder is much higher, as we'll see. And it, and it varies across the whole lifespan. So, of course, our conduct disorders in childhood, um, depression, anxiety, and substance use disorders in adults. So that having an ADHD increases the odds ratio by 7.5 for having a, 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 a bipolar disorder. Uh, of 2.7 to having a major depressive disorder compared to those without ADHD. Uh, the odds ratio of having PTSD is 3.9. The odds ratio of agoraphobia, 5.5. The odds ratio of addiction is 7.9. So having ADHD increases the, the probability of having other co comorbid, another disorder, and that explains also these huge high comorbidity rates. But the link of substance use and ADHD is particularly common. There is an excessive overlap and again, when there is comorbidity, the, the likelihood is even much higher. So that overall, another meta-analysis, it's estimated that 23.1% per, uh, of the patients attending addiction treatments have ADHD, so almost one in every four. Um, the proportion of diagnosis is very ridiculous compared to, to the actual prevalence but that and may explain often uh, treatment failure. And the same applies in France. I mean, this is a, a great study conducted with uh, college students, and they found that the prevalence of ADHD um, in, in this sample of 1,500 students was 5.6, but there was also a strong association with uh, substance use disorders as, as well as other impulsive disorders. So as we can see here, compared to those without ADHD, the, the prevalence of smoking, of cannabis, of binge drinking, of alcohol use disorders uh, were uh, much higher, were significantly higher, but also of having an eating disorders, uh, an internet addiction, um, and other compulsive behavior. So, I mean, the data are data, and these are very clear. Uh, so uh, overall, compared to those without ADHD, children with ADHD, have a twice likelihood of having a lifetime history of nicotine, a three times like, uh, higher risk of a nicotine addiction, twice higher risk of an alcohol use, use disorder, and the same applies to cannabis, to cocaine, or and to addictions overall. Um, just a brief mention about tobacco, about nicotine, because it's the first drug that uh, anyone tries. It, it also applies to ADHD, and as you can see, uh, one minute, I'm done. Um, uh, smokers with and without ADHD have higher rates of 
um, alcohol misuse, alcohol dependence, uh, drug misuse, and drug dependence. And above them, as I said, ADHD and smokers have the higher risk of all of them. So in a sense, it's, it, it, it opens the brain circuit uh, to the tempting effects of, of different drugs um, and because of these reward deficit, deficiencies that uh, I, I spoke to earlier. Finally, two more slides and I'm done. Um, the, the, what's the outcome? I mean, having ADHD and substance use disorder is associated with an early onset of the substance use and abuse, higher severity and chronicity of the addictive disorder, worse outcome of the ADHD symptoms or so persistence. Uh, the, the recent studies have actually highlighted the, it, the influence on the trajectory, most neuropsychological and cognitive impairment, um, higher rates of poly substance abuse, higher rates of psychiatric morbidity, and lower retention rates. And at the end of the day, the revolving door. I mean, the treatment failure, um, go to your psychiatrist, go to your addiction, go wherever, uh, but don't come to my practice. Uh, just um, mentioned to my team, which I'm highly, highly proud of, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Pepe. Uh, we will question in the We will listen to the questions at the end of the session, so as not to uh, remove any time from the next speaker. So, of course, it's difficult to present Frances Levine. She's a, pr a teacher in addictology uh, and psychiatry at Columbia University. She's a high-profile expert. Uh, most of the cited articles were written either by her or her team. It's a major honor to have you here today. Thank you in advance for your conference. Okay. Um, I come from New York, as you probably know already, so therefore I generally try to, I talk fast, uh, which drives the translators crazy. So I will try to slow down a little bit uh, to make it easier both for the translators and anybody who uh, understands English. Um, I'm really delighted to be here. This is a beautiful place. Uh, I've never been to Beiritz before, and I'm very grateful for the organizers to have invited me today, and uh, I really appreciate it. We actually have a pretty good contingent from Columbia, Sandy Comer and Meg Haney, who were all on the same hall together, and we suddenly realized we were all coming to Beiritz, and it was quite a nice uh, thing to find out. So, in any case, um, I'm going to be talking about uh, ADHD uh, and addiction, and it's interesting because because I began doing research in this area. Uh, it was actually interesting how this all happened for me. I came to Columbia, uh, had not been doing research, had done a clinical fellowship in addictions. I was the first fellow in addictions at University of Maryland. Uh, now throughout the country there's about 45 addiction psychiatry residency programs and about 50 or 60 addiction medicine residency. So it's really grown as a specialty in the last uh, 25, 30 years. Uh, but the way I got interested in ADHD really came from my mentor, uh, Herb Kleber, who uh, passed uh, about a year ago. I don't know if anybody, I don't know if it got onto Google homepage in France, but he was on the Google uh, homepage for the United States uh, yesterday um, at the anniversary, an anniversary of his death. So a lot of people in the United States are really indebted to him as a mentor. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit. These are my financial disclosures, which I always present wherever I go. This is the I federal and New York State support, as well as being a consultant for Major League Baseball. Uh, you might say, how did that happen? Well, um, you know, uh, professional athletes, of course, are, it, need to be urine tested, and one of the questions that comes up all the time is whether or not it's okay for, for them to be on stimulant medication. And I actually think the Major League Baseball has a pretty um, uh, forward-thinking approach, which is that if somebody actually does have the diagnosis and it's well-documented, uh, they can actually be on a stimulant medication. And I think that's important because it validates the diagnosis similarly to what we would see with depression or other psychiatric conditions. Um, I always start off with this slide, and you heard earlier from Jose uh, basically the findings in a very, more complex and elegant way, I would say. Uh, but this is the Kessler data, which was already presented, which basically makes the point that if somebody has a substance use disorder, they're about two to three times the risk of having um, ADHD. And similarly, in the reverse, if they have ADHD, they're at higher risk for having a substance use disorder. 
Um, I will tell you that I've trained, uh, I I've run an addiction psychiatry residency now for over 20 years, and a lot of the people that I've trained still, they're running programs, they're running treatment facilities, and they don't have their staff ask about ADHD, which to me is unfortunate because it is an incredibly treatable illness that often goes under the radar because of what you heard before about all the other psychiatric illnesses that are present, and those are frequently what are recognized. I will admit that even in my private practice, I've had episodes where a patient will come in, I've diagnosed them with depression or anxiety, and then they'll say, oh, my son was diagnosed with ADHD, and I seem to have a lot of those similar symptoms, and I'm like, like shocked that I didn't think about it myself. And I tend to do that less now, but I would say 10, 15 years ago, uh, it wasn't uncommon that that would happen. And I think was, as clinicians, we always go with what we're comfortable with, and depression, if you're a psychiatrist, is something you're trained on. Um, adult ADHD in, in many residencies in the United States, and I imagine through Europe, people are not officially or, or trained by their mentors, and partially that's because the mentors themselves weren't, uh, they didn't grow up with learning and being trained uh, when they were going through their training on uh, making the diagnosis of ADHD, particularly in adulthood. So um, I got interested, I said to you, how did I get interested in this? Uh, my mentor, Herb Kleber, uh, sent me to the library. Back then there was a library over 25 years ago instead of the internet. And I went online, I went to the library, and he had sent me there because he was asked to assess uh, a professional athlete who had been in and out of rehab for cocaine dependence. And he remembered that he had published uh, case reports with Ed Kanzian, who is a psychoanalyst who is a very astute individual. Um, he's a wonderful uh, clinician. And he thought that some of his patients with cocaine use disorder had ADD, which back then, it was not even, it was a very controversial diagnosis back in the 80s to call someone as having ADD or AD attention deficit disorder was what it was called back then. Um, and they went, he, he started treating them with methylphenidate and found that both their ADHD and their cocaine use got better. Uh, and this was just simply case reports. And Herb sent me to the library and said, can you read about this and come back with this? Um, and I came back and said, you know, after we talked, I said, yeah, this professional athlete might have ADD, which was totally unrecognized and still today would probably be unrecognized in most treatment facilities, but it did impair his ability to do well in treatment. Well, that really launched my career in this area, um, and at the time, we thought that cocaine use disorders, people would have higher rates than, the, than other substance use disorders with this idea of self-medication. What we've learned over the years is that, in fact, mostly all substance use disorders have elevated rates of ADHD. It's not specific to cocaine use disorder. Now, this doesn't mean that there still isn't potentially the self-medication hypothesis. It could mean that you know um, ADHD is very high in people with cannabis use disorder, for example, but it's not unreasonable to think that somebody who's impulsive, somebody who um, wants to relax or calm down, that marijuana could serve that role too. So it's not drug specific, but it goes probably across different drugs of abuse. Um, nonetheless, the reason I put up these four or five studies is that these were some of the first studies that used structured assessments and uh, evaluated uh, in a systematic way for ADHD. And what you see is the rates range from about 10 to about 23, 24%. <laughs> My rates were more conservative because I took a more conservative approach and somebody needed to have symptoms when they were a child and it needed to be present both in childhood and adulthood, which lowered the rates to some degree. Um, what I will say is that then um, afterwards, as you heard earlier, Van Emmerich published a paper uh, that found rates of about 23%. Um, if you're going to hear me talk today, you're going to hear me rail against meta-analyses. And even though I think this meta-analysis was done very well, it tends to lose the details or the devil's in the details. So in fact, some of the studies that were in the meta-analysis were not done with structured clinical interviews, were screenings, were children combined with adults. So therefore, you get slightly higher rates of about 23%. I think for adults coming in for substance abuse treatment, the rates are probably around 15 to 18 percent, a little bit lower than in the meta-analysis. And in fact, what happened was about maybe 15 years ago, uh, Gert van der Gling, who was sort of the pie piper of ADHD in Europe, approached me and said, um, would you serve as a thesis advisor? I want to look at the rates of ADHD throughout Europe. And I said to him, I said, Gert, you know, there's all of these studies done in, Europe, in the United States showing about 15 to 17 percent of a rate. 
And he said, we got to prove it again. He said, everybody thinks that it's overrated in, in the United States, that it's an American disorder, and we need to assess it again. And I said, great, I'm happy to be involved with this. Um, so he conducted, it was amazing, without any real funding, he got many places, many countries in, in Europe, as well as South Africa and Israel, to look at the rates of ADHD. And the prevalence rates, what he found was a rate ranging from 5 to 31 percent, with an average of about 14 percent, which is sort of in line with the, the four or five studies that, I that are up on this, um, uh, up on this um, slide set. So what you see is the rates are about 14, 50 percent. With DSM-5, it's a little bit higher. The point of this is that not the, the majority of the patients that you're going to see in a substance abuse treatment program will not have ADHD, but there's a substantial minority that will, and not recognizing it has major consequences for their treatment. So you heard a little bit before about why is treating ADHD so important. Um, a number of studies have made the following um, observations, such as if you have ADHD and you're coming in for substance use treatment, you tend to have had an earlier onset of the disorder. You have less of a likelihood of going into remission. If remission is achieved, it takes longer to um, reach remission. And despite having more treatment exposure, people tend to do less well in treatment. The other factor, which you've also heard about extensively, is that there's high rates of psychiatric comorbidities, making the treatment uh, even more complicated. So what are some of the common assumptions? I decided I'd make this more of a clinical talk, and, I'll, and I don't know whether these are assumptions that you hold, but I'm just going to put them out there. Um, that standard treatments for ADHD do not work in active substance users. Even if treatment works for the ADHD, it won't impact on the substance use disorder. Active substance abusers will misuse and divert their medications, and often there are, norm there are numerous psychiatric comorbidities make it even harder to effectively treat individuals with ADHD, so you might as well not treat the ADHD. There's also clinical conundrums that come up um, that you're afraid or people are afraid that they're going to escalate the dose of the stimulants or they're going to run out early. Um, how do you manage diversion and misuse if you're going to use stimulants? And how do you determine whether a stimulant's going to be effective in yielding a benefit in a patient who has co-occurring ADHD and substance use disorders. So these are some of the conundrums that people have as well as the assumptions. So let me go through some of these um, issues one by one. Um, I'm putting this slide up, and this represents, uh, as far as I know, I might have missed a, a study more recently, I don't think so, um, of all the pharmacologic trials that have been done looking at ADHD and substance use disorders. If I put up a slide of all the, tre all the studies that have been done for individuals with ADHD adults without substance use disorders, there'd be scores of them. Um, this is about, as you can see, 15 double-blind trials. I didn't include, a lot of people did open trials, including myself. I've just focused on the double-blind trials, and 13 of them have been an outpatient. What are the trials in red? The trials in red are the ones that have been done in adolescents. There's been hundreds of trials done for ADHD in, in um, adolescents and children. Um, three trials, as far as I could find, that have targeted ADHD and substance use disorders in children. And the results have been variable. Now, why am I here talking about stimulants so much? Well, the bottom line is, is that when, you, when they've tried other drugs, such as atomoxetine, which is approved as a treatment, FDA approved as a treatment for ADHD, um, they don't work as well in substance use populations. Now, I'm saying that without a lot of data. It comes a lot from these three trials that are, um, that are on this slide set, as well as my own clinical experience. Um, in terms of atomoxetine, it's mostly been studied for those with cannabis use disorder, and the results have been fairly mixed. Um, maybe somewhat helpful for the ADHD, one study yes, one study no, um, and certainly not helpful for the cannabis use disorder. There is a study that was done by Tim Willens. As far as I know, it's the only study that's been published that's targeted alcohol dependence with um, ADHD. I just got off the phone about a week or two ago with uh, medications development at the National Institute of Alcoholism and Alcohol Abuse and, and asked them, would they be interested in another study? There's only been one done uh, looking at atomoxetine. Most of the time, the drug that has been studied is methylphenidate. Uh, most of the patients that they've looked at have been cocaine-dependent patients with this idea that maybe a stimulant would help not only for the ADHD, but might have a direct agonist effect. So what are the results of these studies? I've, uh, you, know, you can look at the, the, my quick you know, um, shorthand about what's effective, uh, but let me talk a little bit about a meta-analysis that was done. Um, it's been my experience that a lot of people who do the meta-analyses, in fact, have not been in the trenches working with these patients, and as a result, make assumptions 
based on the meta-analysis that in some ways hurt the field because in the case of this study, this was a, a study done by Cuneal and colleagues, they combined 13 outpatient trials, mixed results is what they said were obtained, and while pharmacologic inventions, they say, modestly improved the ADHD, there was no beneficial effect on drug abuse. So the strength of recommendation of a pharmacologic treatment for ADHD and substance use is therefore modest. And that's what most people are going to read. That's going to be the shorthand. Everybody's going to go to that meta-analysis and say, okay, that's the results. I would say the devil's in the details, and the reality is two studies that have been published that are positive were not included, and some of my studies were included in this meta-analysis, but I'll be the first one to tell you that there were issues with those two studies. Both studies were done before there were the long-acting formulations that had better bioavailability. I thought it was very smart at the time. I was looking at methylphenidate, and I didn't want to give medication three times a day because we know in clinical trials getting patients to be adherent and even taking it one times a day is very difficult. So I used a sustained-release methylphenidate pr preparation that had lower bioavailability than Concerto or Adderall XR because that was what was available at the time. And in my discussion section of both of my clinical papers, I wrote about the fact that this was probably a major limitation and that other formulations should be potentially used and also higher doses should be used. And that's nowhere to be found in meta-analysis. And unfortunately, those two, two studies had a substantial amount of weight to them because they had uh, samples of 100 or, or more than 100 patients in them. Most of the trials that meta-analyses are based on, particularly in the substance abuse field, when you get into psychiatric comorbidity, have samples of like 20, 30, 40, often high dropout rates and often underdosing. And so to make conclusions at this point, I think, is a little premature. But this is what the field often does. And I can talk uh, ad nauseum also about I do a lot of research with cannabis use disorder. And the same thing goes on. There are trials with 20, 40 patients. And even if you do a meta-analysis, there are assumptions that are made that, that limit your ability to take, um, take away messages from it. So I've talked about the limitations. Uh, one of my good colleagues, uh, Jean uh, Pieter um, Carpentier, who's a Flemish psychiatrist, and I wrote a review explaining what the limitations of meta-analysis are and what are some of the issues and what do we need to do moving forward. The problem is, is running a clinical trial, at least in the United States, is something like 500,000 a year. So try to get funded to do these follow-up studies at higher doses and with greater patient samples is quite difficult. And if the results are ambivalent or mixed, often that's the end of the research in that area, which makes it very tough to get a final answer to some of the questions that we have. So what is my take on all the literature? Well, like I said, there's been actually now 15 outpatient trials, 13 conducted in outpatients. And what I would say, if I went study by study, is that most of the studies have some signal in reducing the ADHD symptoms, and about 40% show benefit um, in the substance use, particularly if there's an ADHD response. The majority of the trials are evaluating methylphenidate, and a few have evaluated atomoxetine, only three, and only two studies have, in, have evaluated the amphetamine uh, formulation, which in my opinion, at least for cocaine use disorder, is probably the medication that needs to be used. And people are, for many reasons, afraid of it. Um, and even though with long-acting preparations there's no evidence that it has higher abuse liability than other long-acting preparations of methylphenidate, people tend to avoid it. So let me talk about some of an example of studies that were viewed as negative and why I think they're not so negative. So this was a study by Tim Willens and colleagues. It was a multi-site. They were looking at, this is the one study, like I said, that worked, looked at alcohol dependence and ADHD. If you think about it, alcohol dependence is still the most common substance use disorder, at least in the United States and probably many places throughout the world. So the fact that there's only one study to go on is fairly limited. But nonetheless, um, those with ADHD have an improvement in their, if they're on atomoxetine, have improvement in their ADHD symptoms. Both the general overall finding of improvement has changed from baseline. So the, long, the lower the bar, the better, as well as the two subscales. Now, this study was sub sponsored by Lilly, the makers of atomoxetine. And I think they were smart in their own way because what they looked at was mean changes. A lot of the research that's done for adults with ADHD actually has a, um, a treatment response uh, approach instead. So instead of saying there's a mean change of five or six um, points on a 54-point scale, this scale that they use ranges from zero to 54, they ask for what most of the studies have looked at is a, 
is a responder uh, outcome measure, such as what, what percentage of individuals have a 30 or a 50 percent improvement. And you'd expect that that would be a higher bar than just a mean change. Um, so I think this sort of is consistent with what we find as clinicians in that atomoxetine certainly works, but it doesn't have the effect size that you would see with a stimulant medication. Unfortunately, this was the primary outcome for this trial. What they did is they had everybody become abstinent for at least four days up to 28 days. And then they gave atomoxetine. And what they found is everybody relapsed rather quickly. It didn't matter if you're on active medication or atomoxetine. Everybody within two weeks had had a relapse, and that was an outcome. So this was viewed, at least in the meta-analysis, as a negative trial. The reality, though, is that this may not have been the best outcome measure because um, you know, atomoxetine takes a while to work. When they looked at mean cumulative heavy drinking episodes, which is a common outcome measure used in alcohol treatment trials, what you see is there a dissection over time that after about five, six, seven weeks, you start to see the atomoxetine group having less mean heavy drinking episodes. So this was, I think, an important outcome. It was a secondary outcome, but to me this wasn't a negative trial, both in terms of the ADHD and the, and the atomoxetine, in, in terms of the drinking episodes. It would be nice to compare this to a stimulant medication. That's one of the things we're hoping that we'll be able to do. Well, there have been two large clinical trials that have been done as part of the Clinical Trials Network. The Clinical Trials Network is a NIDA-funded National Institute of Drug Abuse um, uh, federal agency that has funded large, two large clinical trials looking at adolescents with ADHD who are substance users, uh, substance dependent, and another population that was adults with nicotine dependence. Nicotine dependence falls under the purview as well as NIDA. And unfortunately, this was seen as a very negative trial and sort of, I think, put the lid on research in this area, which I think was premature. So this was a study done by Paula Riggs, she's a child psychiatrist out in Colorado, and she did this multi-site, large sample, 300, well-designed trial, but I think the outcomes are a little misleading. So what they found is that if they asked the kids, does your ADHD get better, they found that the placebo versus the oros methylphenidate, which is Concerta, 72 milligrams, which is the maximum FDA-approved dose, but in my opinion might not be high enough, um, the reality was is that they reported, self-reported, same amount of improvement in the ADHD symptoms, no difference. So this was viewed as negative, this was concerning. But when they asked the parents, which was the secondary outcome, again, why did they choose the children over the parents? I don't know, but they did. The parents, there was a significant difference between the two treatment arms as well as cognitive functioning. So again, this was viewed as a negative trial by the meta-analysis, but this is you know, something that would be considered positive in my opinion. Also, when they asked the kids about their self-reported use, no difference between the two treatment arms, Paula Riggs felt that the result of this was because the kids um, that got good psychotherapy, and the psychotherapy, the CBT, is what reduced the symptoms. However, an alternative explanation is they weren't entirely honest. So here's the, the results of the urine results, and what you see is that the mean number of negative urines was, high, was, was um, lower um, negative urines um, were, um, the mean uh, was improved more on the oros methylphenidate than on the placebo. If they had a treatment response, then even more so were the urines more likely um, to be negative. Again, what this suggests is that you, it very much dependent on the outcome. Generally, in most treatment trials, we use urine results as an outcome. Part of the reason they didn't use urine outcomes is that this was a mixed group. These were kids that were using alcohol and other drugs, so they went with self-report. Um, the vast majority of kids in the sample were actually cannabis dependent. So what this suggests is that maybe uh, methylphenidate is helpful, and it helps not just for the ADHD, but also for the marijuana use. But again, this was viewed as a negative study that I would argue had some positive findings that need to be followed up on. Um, now, what Therese Winhausen did, again, this was a CTN trial, multi-site, looking at ADHD and nicotine dependence. All individuals received a nicotine patch, which is, again, questionable of how that may have impacted on the results. But they combined it with counseling, large sample, 255 patients at multi-site, good retention, high compliance, all these good things. They found that the methylphenidate was superior to placebo in improving the ADHD. But remember, this was a NIDA-funded study, so the thing they were most concerned about was the nicotine dependence. And the nicotine depend abstinence didn't seem to be any different at the end of the study on placebo or active meds. So this was a disappointment. 
However, um, Ned Nunes was part of this, and he's a close colleague of mine, and, I, and Ned and I were talking, and I said, you know, in my experience, if somebody doesn't have enough symptoms at baseline, you may not see an effect or it may not have an impact. You would want to be giving the medication or see the effect in the people who have higher symptomatology and maybe greater improvement. And in fact, when a secondary analysis was done, we found that on oros methylphenidate, more likely to have prolonged abstinence if you had a significant improvement or a higher baseline symptomatology. You were more likely to have abstinence on the active treatment arm. So what this tells me is that there is a finding here, but perhaps the group that may be better responding in terms of their nicotine abstinence are those with higher ADHD symptoms. Sean Liu, one of our fellows, and I did a, um, he did a, a computational analysis of where that cutoff might be, and we found that if you had a baseline rating of at least 34 at baseline on an ADHD rating scale, it ra ranges from zero to 54, you are more likely to respond in terms of uh, reduction in your nicotine use and also nicotine abstinence. Of course, this is just a nicotine dependence patients. We don't know if this would hold for other substance abuse, and also it needs to be replicated. When you do these secondary analyses with a hypothesis in mind, it's very helpful, but you can't be definitive about it. You then need to go back and run the next study. And as I mentioned, it's very hard to get funded to do another study to look at this once you have a negative trial that's a large one that's out in the literature. So I remember uh, vividly talking to Maya Kostenia, she's from Sweden, um, about uh, the work that I had done with ADHD and stimulants, and she made me feel terrible because she said, you know, we can't prescribe stimulants because your papers were negative, and whether or not um, it gets uh, supported and, and funded by the, by the government to pay for the medications depends on empirical evidence, and your studies are negative. And she had also run a study, that wasn't just me alone, in which she gave 72 milligrams of Concerta to amphetamine users, people who are amphetamine dependent with ADHD, and found there was no improvement in the ADHD and no improvement in the, in the, in the substance use disorder, in this case, amphetamine use disorder. And I said to Maya, I says, well, if you looked at my papers, I think we need to go to higher doses. I think the doses aren't adequate and the formulations weren't great. Now that there's Concerta available, I think you need to go higher. She went back and worked with a population, criminal offenders, people who were getting released from the prison system, started them on uh, methylphenidate, Concerta, but had the ability to go up to 180 milligrams, which is twice the FDA-approved dosing for, um, for, uh, for uh, ADHD. And lo and behold, what she found was that up to 180 milligrams, there was greater improvement in the ADHD symptoms, at least by 30 percent. Um, more people, 65 percent in the methylphenidate group, 27 percent in the placebo group, it was significantly different, had improvement in their ADHD symptoms. There was also a greater proportion of negative drug urines for those on methylphenidate compared to placebo. So this was the first study with, in my opinion, the correct outcome measures, high dosing, long-acting formulation, finding an effect. But it was a very small study. It actually, you know, had about, um, you know, not even, you know, 17, you know, 26, 26, about 52 patients in it. And there was a very high dropout. And despite the high dropout, more than 50 percent of the patients had dropped out in, a, in after about seven or eight weeks, still got with an ITT analysis a significant finding. Well, while she was doing this study, I was sort of moving along with our study in the United States. I had the good fortune of being able to work with John Grabowski, who was a big advocate for higher dosing dextroamphetamine for cocaine abusers. And we paired, we paired up together and did a multi-site looking at people with ADHD and cocaine dependence. And I'm very grateful because NIDA supported this study and allowed us to go to 60 and 80 milligrams of Adderall XR. In my private practice, I usually give about 30 for somebody without ADHD, so 60 and 80 was pushing the, pushing the dose. And it was a randomized trial. Like I said, two arms. I wanted to do one arm, and John convinced me, two arms, and John convinced me to do three arms. And in retrospect, he was correct. Um, we had individualized psychotherapy. I was very worried when this trial was running because Paula was going around the country saying that the cognitive behavioral therapy sort of washed out any medication effect. And here we were doing a fairly intensive psychotherapy that targeted both the ADHD and the cocaine use. Uh, the reality was the psychotherapy didn't help that much. The retention in the study was high, uh, substantially higher than the Constenia study. We had about 74 percent staying in the study, which was great for a group that also had ADHD. Um, and what we found was that in terms of uh, the ARS score, this rating that I said from 0 to 54, significantly better 
on the medication than on placebo. And when we looked at a mean change, also there was significant, whether you looked at a percentage improvement in the group that had at least a 30% improvement versus a mean change, the two groups were significant compared to placebo. The holy grail, though, of course, is the drug use. What happened to the drug use? And this was a pretty lawful curve. I was actually, you know, this is why I'm happy John had me do this, is that we had, um, we looked at 60 versus 80 versus placebo. And what you can see from this graph is that basically, if I, you look here, this represents placebo. This is 60, this is 80. And what you see is that if you look at the positive urines, uh, the placebo group had much higher rates of positive urines and 60 less so and 80 the best. You wonder if you went even higher, if there'd be even more of a difference. Uh, what's really interesting is that this was significant regardless of whether we can treated missing data as missing or missing data as positive, which is much more conservative, obviously. If you say that every urine you don't have or every week you don't have a urine is basically a positive week. So either way we looked at the data, it was significant. The holy grail, or I will say even the higher bar, is what happens at the end of treatment. Um, NIDA has, has been interested in the FDA request for how many people at the end of your trial has been abstinent for a few weeks. That's considered uh, a hard outcome to reach because if you think about it, if somebody drops out of treatment, you don't have that result and they're considered a, a, a treatment failure. So um, it, it, these rates are a little deceptive because this represents everybody. So if somebody drops out, they're in the denominator. And what you can see is that, again, the 60 and then even the high 80 milligrams are more likely to have periods of abstinence. The Constenia study didn't analyze the data in this way, and I think to some degree the reason she didn't was because the dropout was greater than 50 percent. The effect would get washed out if you had to include everybody that dropped out in the denominator. Um, now, we were also interested in what happened to marijuana use, because I'm interested in marijuana treatment. And interestingly, um, it, it, in fact, the group that was on the active treatment also had a reduction over time. About 50 percent of the sample were also using marijuana. These were people not coming in for treatment for marijuana. And the concern was, okay, they're going to substitute. Now you're giving them a stimulant. They're going to feel edgy. Maybe they're going to take marijuana more. The fact was the marijuana use went down also over the course of the trial. So that was positive. And in fact, right now we're doing a small pilot study giving Adderall XR to cannabis-dependent patients with ADHD. As far as I know, there hasn't been any study looking at a stimulant for cannabis use disorder in ADHD. So what are my treatment recommendations? Well, certainly atomoxetine is helpful for alcohol dependent. At least the one study suggests so. Um, but it hasn't been shown to be as helpful for other drugs of abuse. I gave it to cocaine abusers thinking, God, this would be great if I could use atomoxetine rather than a stimulant for people with ADHD and cocaine dependence. Uh, what I found is the ADHD got better, but the patients, like 75% of my open study, 75% of the patients dropped out. And when you have that in an open trial, it sort of makes you think and say, well, maybe I won't do this in a double-blind study and spend five years trying to collect this data. Bupropion I haven't talked that much about. I've done one study with methadone patients. Um, it wasn't found to be that helpful, but certainly there are open studies suggesting it's useful, particularly if there are substance use disorders include also ADHD and mood symptoms, and particularly if there's cigarette cessation, uh, it can be helpful. Um, you know, a lot of the patients with ADHD have higher rates of, of tobacco dependence, and I haven't really talked too much about that today. Certainly there's off-label medications that can be used, but at the end of the day, when, when non-stimulants don't work, you're sort of left with, okay, do I use amphetamine or do I use methylphenidate formulations when somebody has um, a substance use disorder? So will active substance abusers misuse or divert their medication? I think the answer to that is yes, possibly, uh, but many of them actually do not, surprisingly. Um, who are, who's most at risk for stimulant use, misuse, and diversion? At least in the United States, um, most of the surveys show it's much higher in college students and high school students. And when you talk to them, most of these kids will say that they're using stimulants um, to get through exams, to concentrate, less likely, although present, to use it to get high. When they start playing with the medication, such as crushing it and snorting it, that's a different situation. And that's why the longer acting preparations, which are much harder to do that with, are really the drugs that should be used. If you're going to use medication, particularly in adolescence, you're better off using longer acting preparations. The majority got their medications from friends in the sort of mistaken belief that it's safe. If a doctor prescribed it, I can just take it without a recognition that you really have to understand if there's any cardiovascular or psychiatric reasons that you might not want to give uh, stimulants, and kids get them from friends thinking that it's fine. Now, 
Part of the reason I don't think it's abused, particularly longer acting formulations, is really knowing something about the route of administration. Um, IV cocaine and IV methylphenidate, Norovolkov pretty much definitively showed that they feel the same to the patient. You get high pretty easily if you give someone IV methylphenidate. Luckily, the longer acting formulations, such as Concert, are almost impossible to use in that way. And if you're taking them orally, the uptake into the striatum in the brain is much slower, the dissociation is slower, and therefore people rarely feel much of a high. Now, Nora wrote about there being very little high. Certainly, you can get high with an oral product, but the, but the high that you experience and it's, is much reduced than if you snort it or if you um, inject it. Um, there's more evidence that we certainly should be using long-acting stimulants over immediate release and perhaps as a first-line treatment. Um, I think that um, it can be frustrating for patients um, to make them go through a lot of ineffective treatments before an, a drug that might be more effective, particularly Liz Dexamphetamine, which I'm not sure is available in France. Maybe you could tell me if it is. Or, is it available in France, Liz Dexamphetamine, Vyvanse? Yes, okay. So, um, you know, that is one of the smoothest medications. Most of my patients in private practice that I have as adults, I now have either on Concerta or Listix amphetamine. Um, and to sort of relay people's fears about using these long-acting preparations, these were a study that was done. It was an internet survey in the United States. And what you can see is that Adderall and Ritalin are more likely to be misused or abused. Concerta and Vyvanse have very low rates, particularly when you take into account the prescribing rate of 100,000 prescriptions, the rates of Concerta and Vyvanse are very low. Still possible, what I will say is this is a little deceptive, this slide, because it goes to 49 years old. If I took just 18 to 25 year old kids, it would probably, or it is, two to three times higher, but still um, not as high as you might expect. Now, what would you think about giving it to stimulant users, people who have an underlying substance use problem? The consensus of me and many other investigators in the United States is that abuse among individuals with a substance use disorder is actually pretty low. Um, the group that we've seen it more, I've seen it more, is people with a bipolar diathesis, and that's part of a whole longer discussion. Interestingly, none of the clinical trials have reported diversion or misuse, that all those 15 trials I, I showed you. Now, of course, we weren't asking many of the trials, but a point I would make is I was working in a methadone program, and I, I can tell you I would be hearing back from the counselors if they got any win that people were misusing the medication outside. If anything, if patients were using cocaine, the cocaine would be what they would go back to. They didn't feel much of an effect. I was happy to see that Therese Winhausen actually looked at misuse and abuse in two of the trials of the CTN that I mentioned, the one in the adults with nicotine dependence and the one that was done with substance use patients. And what they found is that adolescents with substance use disorders were not more likely than the adults um, to describe feeling euphoric on the oros methylphenidate. What was true, and you might not be surprised, is the adolescents more than the adults were more likely to lose their pills, but this is common to ADHD. But when they needed the replacement pills, there was no difference in the methylphenidate arm versus the placebo arm. So that's a little reassuring. Thank you. Okay, five minutes. Okay, so also what they can see is that most groups found that the oros methylphenidate uh, was the medication they found it was effective more than the placebo arm. Now, you remember in that adolescent study, there was no difference, but this also incorporated a lot of the adults from the other study. And what you can see, if you look down from placebo to oros methylphenidate, when you ask them, do you crave drugs? Are you selling your medication? Did you get high on the medication we gave you? Everything was non-significant and actually very low rates. Not absent, but much lower rates. So what are some of the assumptions? I'll go through these very quickly. Numerous psychiatric comorbidities make it harder to effectively treat. The answer to this is, is probably yes. Um, as you heard and you saw on the other slide, um, the rates of other psychiatric, I mean, I've been focused in sort of a um, uh, myopic way in which I've been looking at ADHD and substance use disorders. Most patients, when they come for treatment, have other psychiatric disorders and often depression and anxiety. So what do you do when you see all of this? Um, usually there, there's very little empirical data to tell you what to do. As I said, there's not, there's not even enough data for ADHD with substance use disorders. When you start adding comorbidities on board, um, coming up with any empirical conclusions is very difficult. But generally, what I would say I've done and other people do in private practice is to treat the most impairing symptom first. If somebody's coming in suicidal and severely depressed, 
you know, you treat the depression first, and then you probably, but don't forget to think about ADHD, because ADHD may make the, the treatment of the, may make it more complicated and harder to treat the depression. Um, often patients can get anxious with stimulants, and so therefore you have to be nimble in thinking about which stimulant would work. My experience has been methylphenidate causes less jitteriness and anxiety than you might see with a stimulant, except the long-acting stimulants like Vyvanse, I've seen that a lot less. Patients may tolerate atomoxetine better if they have anxiety, and that might be the way to go in those patients. Um, and then you need to be cautious, of course, if there's a pre-existing psychosis, and particularly if there's um, bipolar. I don't have enough time to really talk about it in detail, but um, it was a very reassuring study done by Vic Torin in American Journal of Psychiatry saying that if you treat the bipolar illness and put somebody on a mood stabilizer and then add a stimulant, there was no increased rates of mania. So, um, you know, you would treat the bipolar first, but then if they still have ADHD symptoms, often these two disorders are comorbid, you m might be able to do it in that, in that environment. Um, Another clinical conundrums are such as escalating doses. What do you do about that? How do you manage diversion? And how do you assess improvement? Um, this is a slide that comes from John Mariani and I. We were sort of partners in crime together. We've done a lot of research over the years together. And he makes a point, and I make this point, that any medication that has abuse liability um, has risks associated with it. If I was standing up here and talking about benzodiazepines or talking about using opiates with somebody who has pain or acute pain, um, there's this sweet spot in which you have to balance the risk and the benefits. And if you're conservative in your prescribing, then you'll never have a risk of, under, of misuse or diversion because you're not giving them the medication. On the other hand, you have risk of undertreatment. And I think that is often the, the direction that most clinicians go in. On the other hand, if you're extremely liberal, then of course you're not going to have any undertreatment, but then you're going to have higher rates of misuse and diversion. And I think you have to walk that line. If you're going to prescribe a drug of abuse potential, you need to be able to walk that line and think carefully about each patient. So I'm not going to get up here and say every patient should be put on a stimulant. I think it depends on the patient, the relationship you have, and how you're monitoring that patient's case. Certainly there are red flags to look at. You know, if somebody's very intoxicated when they come in, if they come in and say, doc, extended D meds don't work for me, you have to give me the immediate release, repeatedly losing prescriptions, although in the United States this is now not a much of an issue. Um, I practice in New Jersey and in New York, and I have to um, do everything electronically, so the issue of lost prescriptions is sort of now not a problem. But if somebody's running out short or early all the time, that's something that you need to follow. Um, you have to figure out what's happening. Is this happening because they're disorganized, they're losing their medication? Are they, in fact, abusing it? Are, if they're bipolar, are they capturing or trying to capture in a good feeling that they would get in an early manic episode? Maybe they feel blunted and that they start using drugs to feel better. Um, or maybe they just don't have an adequate therapeutic dose. Um, and I think you can, the benefit of a stimulant medication is you can always just stop it. I think people feel like, oh, if I start it, I'm not going to be able to stop it. It's different than a benzodiazepine. I've had a couple of times when I've said to a patient, I don't feel comfortable with you being on this med, and after many discussions, I'll take them off. Um, so how do you limit the diversion and misuse, keeping track of pills, looking at state prescribing databases if you have them where you're working, uh, frequent patient visits, using long-active preparations, talking about safe storage is very important. I wonder if sometimes I'm just talking to myself, if I'm talking to a, a young adult, but if somebody's going off to college, don't advertise that you have Ritalin or you have stimulants. You know, keep it locked, keep it in your drawer. Sometimes they do it. What is interesting is that if kids find it helpful, young adults, they don't want to give up their medication. They know how hard it is to get it. If they run short, their psychiatrist may not prescribe it to them. So in fact, they'd rather not have the pressure of people saying, oh, can you give me this? I need it for exams or whatever. Um, limit setting is very important. You can set a contract up where you have them sign a contract of what the, what the rules of the treatment are. What I would say is I think that treats the doctor more than the patient, but I, because there's no evidence that those work. But I do think they're helpful at least for describing what, what you feel are the contingencies of when you would not continue to prescribe the medication. Um, also, uh, how do you find out if there's a benefit? Uh, one of the things, I'm a big believer in using structured instruments. When I'm with my patients in private practice, every few months I will have them work with me and fill out a form looking at their ADHD symptoms. If they're not getting any better or there doesn't seem to be improvement in their quality of their life, then probably staying on the medication isn't helping them. The other point I make is if somebody's coming into treatment and has an active substance use disorder, unless they're addressing that at the same time, and they're actively involved in treatment for that, either with me or with someone else, 
I'm not gonna just prescribe stimulants. So it's a whole package deal. And usually the kids on campuses who have ADHD that are selling their medications or giving it to others, let's say they're being prescribed it, are kids that are using substances and have a substance use problem themselves. Um, so I'm gonna end by just making treatment recommendations. Certainly there are non-pharmacologic interventions. I haven't focused on that in this talk given the time limitations, but certainly there's a wide range of psychotherapy treatment that particularly in adults is very helpful that is often part of the, the treatment. I often use Safran's treatment manual which involves cognitive behavioral therapy which focuses both on the ADHD and then also then focusing on the substance use disorder. Uh, one minute, okay, I'm almost done. So non-pharmacologic approaches adjunctively, certainly um, group therapy, individual therapy, mutual health groups such as AA or NA for some patients. Um, family therapy for adolescents and young adults can be very helpful. Um, ADHD patients, they really benefit from organizational coaches and cognitive behavioral therapy can be helpful. And because there's so much effective illness, also the cognitive therapy can address the major effective um, disorders as well. Um, so in conclusion, standard treatments for ADHD do not work in active substance users. That was what I started with. I hope I've convinced you that that's probably not true. We certainly need more research. Um, even if treatment works for ADHD, they don't, doesn't impact on the substance use disorders. I think that depends. I think if you make sure patients are adherent, long-acting formulations and high enough dosing uh, probably will work, but we need more research again. Active substance users will misuse and divert their medication. Some individuals will, but if anything, um, those patients, at least in clinical trials, in my experience, they actually ask for dose reductions. We spend more time reducing dose than patients saying to us they want their doses raised. Um, if they have psychiatric comorbidities, you can treat all three. It's complicated, but it can be done, usually focusing on the more severe disorders first, but don't forget about the ADHD. And there are ways that different clinical conundrums can be managed, as I've mentioned. I'd like to thank um, John Mariani, who I work closely with, NIDA, who has provided support for me throughout the years, as well as uh, the other people listed on this slide. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francis. Today, I had the wrong role. Sorry. <laughs> OK. Merci beaucoup. Uh, bon, on est pris par le temps, mais on va prendre... Uh, attendez. Combien Une ou deux questions, si vous pouvez poser des questions. Well, I don't know if you have any questions, broad questions that would be good, short and brief and concise, and uh, I promise that the answers will be short. Are there any hands from the floor? If there are no hands, I think it's all been said. Jean-Pierre. Not many comments, uh, just to congratulations to Francis and Jose for their excellent presentations. Just a, 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 a practical question, though, to, to uh, what pathology do you manage to prescribe the methylphenidate? You've talked about 190 milligrams. 180, or are there cases where it goes beyond or above uh, 180 milligrams, uh, or is that, and what is the maximum dose that you've ever had to prescribe? Yes. Okay. Uh, let me get this off. I've, I've never gone above 120, actually. Um, in this clinical trial, they went, I think the mean dose was about 144. Um, I think once you get over 180, it's probably diminishing returns at that point. Um, but I think, you know, doctors are obviously very cons afraid of doing that because this is just one trial, and the approved dosing, at least in the United States, is 72 milligrams, so that's less than half the dose of what, um, you know, 180 would be, you know, substantially higher. But I think if you're going to prescribe, you have to be comfortable with going high enough, um, and I think that is sort of the take-home message um, with a good amount of documentation and the patient understanding that you're going above these doses and monitoring blood pressure. Um, I was actually surprised. I was at CPDD, the College on Problems of Drug Dependence, and um, they're doing a study that I wish we were doing in the United States looking at lisdexamphetamine for amphetamine use disorder. And I think they're going up to like 250 milligrams. And again, the maximum dose of lisdexamphetamine is 70. And they're not even collecting blood pressure. Like I, they, they had it in their baseline um, 
they have a paper that's out talking about the um, methods of that study, which they said they're doing um, uh, blood pressure management. And I said, well, what are you doing in the study now that you're actually running? This is, oh, we're not bothering with it. And I thought that was fascinating because in the US, um, you know, I really have to drop patients when their blood pressures get even over 160 or 100 on systolic and diastolic. So, um, you know, I think that's, gr I don't know if it's great, but it's, it's, it's interesting that they're able to be able to do that study that way. Um, so I think one of the issues that you have when your doses start getting higher is looking, making sure you monitor their sleep, making sure you monitor the blood pressure, and having them come in frequently. What wasn't said on the talk is I wouldn't give somebody a month's supply and send them out if I was giving those kind of doses. You have to, I would see, see them every single week, and that would be the requirement, at least on, in my hands. Um, other doctors might do something different.